Welcome to today's lecture on biodiversity, talking about different types of organisms uh, that we find. And we're going to take a little survey of the different kinds of living things we have uh, that perhaps we'll see around campus or in our wildlife sanctuary. Uh, first, I'd like to start by talking about the idea of uh, back to talking about Carl Linnaeus and his scientific uh, um, taxonomy, signs of naming and classifying organisms. Uh, at the time, when, when Linnaeus was doing his work, uh, since, since that time, I should say, a great deal more information has come out uh, using, say, DNA technology and, and things like that. And uh, what we do now is uh, th there's many ways that life is classified, but probably the most common and, and perhaps most current is this idea of the three domain system. So that's what we'll talk about today, the three domain system, which includes the eukarya, uh, the archaea, and the bacteria. And so the idea is that all living forms of life came from this common ancestor and that life evolved and changed over time to give you these three very distinct groups with subgroups within that and that's what we'll talk about and uh, we'll start by talking about bacteria and uh, by no means are we trying to cover all the different um, individual organisms there are just sort of giving you a sample of them so we'll talk about the domain bacteria first and the domain bacteria uh, you're familiar with our, our organisms that are our bacteria and you've probably had a, a, like a bacterial infection before you heard about bacteria before you should already know from a previous uh, week that we talked about them being a prokaryotic celled organism prokaryotic meaning that they came before sort of the nucleus. So these are organisms that basically are, are quite small. They do not have a nucleus, and instead they have their DNA sort of in the middle there. Uh, they have a cell membrane like all cells do, and most of them also have a cell wall outside of that. Okay, um, so I'll just sort of mention a couple things about them. One thing about the bacteria is that they're found all over the place. They're found all over the world lots of different species. They have a very large range of nutritional diversity, meaning there are some uh, that do cause infections in humans, for example, but there are some that are photosynthetic. Uh, there are some that uh, use other sources of energy other than light. So in terms of nutritional diversity, bacteria are probably the champions, and they do uh, basically every kind of thing you can think of in terms of digesting uh, different things. We use bacteria, for example. There are some that will even digest or break down toxic waste, for example. So a whole bunch that we use them to clean water in some cases. Uh, so a whole bunch of them. I'll give you some specific examples. A uh, particularly bad one is this Clostridium botulinum, which uh, causes a botulism uh, botulism from the botulism toxin, very strong exotoxin, uh, a protein that the organism makes and secretes. Uh, one gram of it's enough to kill one million people. And uh, this is a soil organism, so you find this in the dirt, actually. And the botulism toxin, interesting enough, is the same component they use in Botox. Um, so it's a muscle paralyzer and, and and apparently you can inject it in just the right small amounts um, although it can kill you if you get too much of it obviously mainly from like eating it uh, you can um, find these uh, like I said in the soil um, but but anyway they use it in Botox and the exotoxins what paralyzes um, your uh, muscles in your face and so forth uh, to make you look younger um, but, you know, I'll just uh, end it with that. Uh, but again, uh, once again, you know, it's a very toxic um, substance. Uh, for the most part, um, you should keep in mind, uh, though, that most bacteria are actually beneficial. So you hear about bacteria a lot and you always think about how bad they are. But actually, most of them are beneficial. There's a whole bunch. For example, nine out of the ten cells that are on your body 
uh, are actually not your cells. So about 90%, 99% in some cases, say on your skin, uh, is not even your own cells. Instead, they're bacteria, fungi, other things like that. Uh, remember, like if you look here, these are the bacteria. They're very, very tiny. So in terms of number of cells, uh, we have bacteria all over our skin, in our digestive tract, and most of them are not harmful to us, and actually they help prevent other things from uh, attacking us. So most bacteria actually uh, in nature uh, are quite beneficial in terms of breaking down uh, waste and things like that. Okay, next group you're probably not very familiar with is the domain archaea. And the domain archaea also are prokaryotic cells. Uh, these are used to be what we used to call the ancient bacteria, and uh, we no longer refer to them really that way anymore. It turns out they're probably more related to eukaryotic cells than, uh, than to bacteria. Uh, but they're, they're uh, prokaryotic, so once again, they have a nucleus. Um, no nucleus, sorry, they have no nucleus, so there'll be a cell. DNA inside. Uh, there are some other differences, though, that make them, even though they're prokaryotic, that make them more like eukaryotic in terms of their DNA sequences and so forth. Uh, the archaea are kind of a unknown uh, group to most people, but uh, they fall into some distinct categories, such as what we call thermophiles or methanogens. And so, uh, for example, the thermophiles, uh, if you're down, say, at the bottom of the ocean here, all right, so this is where you would be. And if you go down to the very bottom of the ocean where maybe it's, say, 30,000 feet deep or so, very, very deep, uh, at these hydrothermal vents where you have this boiling water coming out, uh, you'll find these archaea down here. So so many of them, we also call them, another term you'll see, extremophiles, uh, because many of them live in these very extreme environments, such as the bottom of the ocean and, and so forth. So those are the archaea. Okay, and then uh, the next group is the domain um, eukarya. So everything else will be in the domain eukarya. So these are all eukaryotic organisms. Um, and we'll start by talking about this specific group here, the protozoa. So if you were going to name these or classify all these different organisms, we'd have our three domains. And so the highest level of organization here would be the domain. That would be, in this case, like I said, the eukarya. And then after that, you would have say, kingdom, and then you would have phylum, and so forth, working your way down, kingdom, phylum, class, and, and onward. Now, sometimes, for example, with the protozoa, uh, we, we've debated on how to put these and where to put these. Uh, we won't worry too much about this in this class, but it turns out if you take all the eukarya they probably are sort of broken up into smaller groups, but I'll kind of do it the old-fashioned way where we'll just say the protozoa is one particular group because we're not going to cover so many of them. It doesn't matter uh, so much. So you could say they're in their own kingdom or in their own phylum, even though it turns out they're not. Okay, uh, so protozoa typically are what we used to call, and we will for this class, the single-celled, eukaryotic organisms. So if you look here, for example, these are red blood cells, which are found in your body. But this organism right here, this organism right here is called trypanosoma. And trypanosoma um, is a eukaryotic cell, okay? It's an infectious disease that causes, in this case, a disease called African sleeping sickness. Uh, malaria, you've probably heard of before, is also caused by a protozoa, a different one. Uh, that particular one is plasmodium. And those are two of the common uh, sort of eukaryotic disease-causing organisms. So there's a whole bunch in this protozoa. Most of them live in like freshwater ponds and are not pathogens are not harmful to you, uh, but I just want to give you sort of a little survey of a couple of those. Uh, the next group then we'll talk about are plants and trees. should be familiar with plants and trees, about 250,000 species. Most important part about fo um, 
organisms that are in this category though is they do photosynthesis and just as a reminder remember photosynthesis uh, is used to make sugar or glucose which is a sugar and that's very important to animals because and plants because then what happens is in cellular respiration this glucose can be fed into cellular respiration to make ATP and ATP you know is the main energy source that cells are running on uh, so a lot of different plants and trees uh, one of the oldest is this bristlecone pine they've measured uh, these are bristlecone pines here uh, 4,900 years old. There's also a, a plant called a creosote bush that uh, might hold the record as well. Uh, this one sort of lives and dies and lives and dies and sort of forms these rings. So it's not it's not the same organism, uh, but these have been measured to be maybe 10,000 years old. So many of these plants you see, like a bristlecone pine, you can actually take a core sample where they take the they take the tree like that and then they they drill in and take a core sample of that and then what you get out of that is you get this core like that uh, and then you can see all these rings in it and you can count 4,900 rings and see that that tree is you know approximately that old okay next group are the fungi the fungi are things like mushrooms and molds uh, about a hundred thousand species some of them are parasites uh, athlete's foot probably heard of before uh, ooh. athletes foot or athletes feet fungal infection uh, you can get it on your on your feet you can get the same thing on on, on your fingernails for example um, but that's a that's a parasitic form of a fungus uh, many of our antibiotics that we use uh, particularly like the penicillins okay the first penicillins those came from uh, actually from mushrooms so a very important group that way uh, also important for uh, breaking down uh, decaying matter uh, the next group we'll talk about are uh, the group uh, called uh, the Nidarians uh, and so these are all the animals so this would be in the kingdom then if you wanted to do that the kingdom animalia so these are all the animals and we'll talk about the uh, Nidarians here. The Nidarians include things like the sea jellies, used to be called um, jellyfish, but it's not really a fish. So sea jellies, like you see here in this particular case, we have uh, like a um, um, a like a stinging Medusa stage, uh, the Medusa stage. So you you find these sort of two different body types. One's what they call the Medusa stage, which is what you think of when you see a jellyfish. What you call a jellyfish, that's that one there. And then if you turn that thing upside down, a different species has this body plan called the polyp stage. And sometimes, you know, one species will have just this and another species will have just this. And sometimes they'll sort of switch between these two body types. Uh, thing about Nidarians is they, they have these specialized cells called nindocytes, and the nindocytes contain these specialized stinging structures called nematocysts. So the nematocysts are the stinging structures that are inside the nindocytes. And sometimes the nematocyst has a toxin or something like that with it and actually can poison you. Um, and, and there are, have been cases where people have died. Um, from these very, some species are very toxic of those. Next group are the mollusca, and the mollusca or the mollusks uh, include things like clams and snails and squid and, and octopods. And uh, most of these have a specialized structure called a radula. In fact, most species of plants and animals are distinguished by one or two or three particular traits. And so the idea is that these probably, as they evolved, they gained some particular trait in that group, then pretty much kept that. Um, for example, almost all the species of mollusca have this radula. Uh, one group that doesn't are clams, and those are typically filter feeders. But for the most part, they have this um, 
Radula is a file-like structure used for scraping food off rocks, like in the case of a snail and things like that. Um, in the case of squids, and like this case of an octopus here, uh, they'll have the radula inside a beak-like structure that they can use for biting things with, actually. And then the next group are the arthropoda. Uh, so the arthropoda are the arthropods, very big group, uh, about three quarters of a, of a million species. Uh, this is probably the largest, uh, this definitely is the largest group of things we've identified so far, um, and probably one of the largest groups uh, out there. Probably more bacteria in reality um, than anything else, but but not identified as many yet as we have a, 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 of the arthropods. Uh, their name, arthro, Poda comes from the idea of them having like a jointed foot. Uh, so pod refers to foot and arthro, like arthroscopic, refers to like a joint. Uh, they have a hard exoskeleton, very big group. Uh, and I'll tell you about some of the subgroups within that. So this would be like phylum arthropoda. And then these would be a class or a subclass within that, like the arachnids. So arthropods is the bigger group, and then within that, there are smaller groups like the arachnids. These are spiders and scorpions. Uh, these all have eight legs, and many of them, most of them, in fact, have venom of poison of some sort, so you know about a scorpion sting or the bite of a black widow spider. Um, uh, so those would be examples of spiders and scorpions. And then we also have um, the insects, another group. These include all the insects. You're familiar with many of these, probably beetles, flies, ants, uh, so forth are all um, examples of insects, dragonflies, things like that. Uh, these all have six legs as an adult. Uh, so as juveniles, like in a caterpillar, they may have no legs or they might have, you know, many different legs. But as an adult, insects have six different legs and uh, probably more described species uh, than anything else, specifically beetles. Beetles is the largest group um, of things that have been identified, mostly from the tropics. And we've been identifying beetles for a long time. But like I said, there's probably other groups uh, that we'll find later on there, that there are in fact more of, such as bacteria. Okay, also within the arthropoda, not so much big on land, but in the ocean, uh, we have the group called the crustaceans. A uh, whole bunch of crustaceans in the ocean, crabs, lobsters, and barnacles. Um, there's um, most of them, like I said, live in the ocean, but uh, what you call the roly-poly, also called the pill bug. Okay, that's this creature right here. That's an example of a crustacean as well, but one you find on land. Uh, then we have the echinodermata. The echinodermata or the echinoderms are what we call the spiny skinned animals. Those include sea stars. So once again, starfish and a starfish is not uh, accurate because it's really not a fish. Star, starfish, uh, brittle stars, that's this one here, the brittle star, and uh, then sea urchins uh, among them. Whoop, back to that. There we go. So those are our um, different examples there. There are others. Those are the ones you're probably familiar with. Uh, uh, what makes it kind of derms unique is they have this water vascular system. So the water vascular system is a network of tubes that allow the organism to move water in and out. So for example, in a sea star, this little part right up here is called the madreporite. You don't need to worry about that term, but it, it pulls water in through that hole and it moves water down to these arms here. And inside the, at the, at the ends of these arms are these little, um, little suction feet. Okay, so I do that really big. But if you ever turn a sea star over, they have a whole bunch of these little suction feet. And that's what they use to cling to rocks and, and, and open things up with. And so that's part of the water vascular system. Uh, the next group are the fish. And fish fall into sort of two broad groups. Uh, one are the bony fish. And the other group is the cartilaginous fish. Uh, and those include sharks and skates and rays and things like that. Whereas the bony fish include uh, things like Finding Nemo, um, clownfish and things like that. Most fish that you know other than sharks fall into this group, the bony fish. Um, very, very big group. 
One of the things you find as a common feature uh, in fish is they often have a lateral line. A lateral line system is, is a sensory set of uh, specialized cells and structures that run along the side of the body and that allows them to sense vibration and so the lateral line uh, is primarily used for sensing vibration um, or it's a form of, you can think of it as same as the idea of hearing but they hear with their body instead so they're very sensitive to sound and change and pressure that they can uh, feel with their body okay and uh, our next group then are the amphibians the amphibians include frogs and salamanders, as are our, our, our groups you're probably most familiar with. So frogs and salamanders. Uh, many of them have thin, most of them have thin, moist skin. Um, that means because they have thin, moist skin, the salamanders and the amphibians are one of the first groups uh, to come back onto land as, as vertebrates, at least animals with backbones. Uh, so probably evolved from fish-like ancestors and then came onto land. Uh, and when you come onto land, one of the problems is, is um, you're, you're moving from water where you can get um, uh, oxygen from the water and then you move onto land and, and suddenly you have the issue of trying to get oxygen from the air, which is different from getting it from the water. Uh, so what you find in amphibians is most of them do not have very well-developed lungs, and instead they try to absorb oxygen through their skin. Uh, but the problem with that is you also can dry out when you're on land. So most species uh, are pretty much tied to water, at least for reproduction. Uh, there's only a few kinds of salamanders and frogs that sort of stay out of... Um, stay away from the water and can survive without being close to water for at least uh, uh, dry periods. Uh, one example I'll tell you about here are the poison arrow frogs you might have heard of. These are brightly colored frogs that uh, eat um, centipedes and things like that and they uh, concentrate the toxin of them and the toxin for example in this type of poison arrow frog um, if you were to eat it or lick it or that kind of thing uh, some of them you can just hold for example and they can be very toxic and the toxin can go right through your skin. Uh, next group is of course my favorite uh, that is the reptiles and the reptiles uh, include snakes uh, lizards, crocodiles, turtles, and so forth. Uh, here's the big drooly looking uh, Komodo dragon, largest lizard in the world, 10 feet long, uh, big enough to eat a person every now and then. Um, and um, actually, they've just recently discovered that, that the, well, you're saying there's just bacteria in that slobbery mess when they bite you, but now they think there's actually a toxin in there as well. Uh, and then, of course, you have the turtles, uh, which have this hard shell on the top and the bottom. And so they have basically a little house that they can bring with them uh, that uh, protects them. Uh, reptiles have scales. And, and so different than amphibians, the scales in reptiles allow them to prevent uh, them from drying out. So they can actually, they're one of the first groups that can actually remain away from land and tolerate that. They also have this specialized structure called an amniotic egg. And the amniotic egg is a hard shelled egg with uh, different membranes that allow the egg to have nutrition in it to help it develop kind of like a chicken egg. And then our next group are the birds. Um, and birds are um, one of our first groups that we see that are what we call endothermic, which means they rely on their own metabolism to keep their body warm. I think we saw that term uh, before. Uh, sort of the distinguishing characteristic we use for birds is that they have feathers. And there are many dinosaurs now that we're finding um, probably had feathers and birds are thought to be a type of dinosaur uh, that still happened to survive, whereas most of the dinosaurs went extinct. Uh, but sort of the characteristic we use to define uh, uh, what a bird is versus, uh, say, other dinosaurs is the presence of of these feathers. And we think that feathers now uh, probably were not first used for flying, uh, but rather to keep uh, birds warm. So probably the first feathers evolved in birds, uh, not for flying, uh, but to keep them warm. Um, and, and the feathers are made out of keratin, and keratin's the thing, same thing that our hair is made out of and, and our fingernails. 
okay? And then our last group here are the mammals. Uh, mammals have hair. Um, so even things like the largest animal in the world, the blue whale, largest animal, even larger than all the dinosaurs have little tiny hairs on their body. Uh, here's a kangaroo, uh, sort of three different groups uh, of mammals. There's ones that lay eggs. There's those that uh, have a pouch that the baby develops in. And then the one you're most commonly familiar with are things like whales uh, that feed their young uh, using their mammary glands. So mammary glands uh, are breast tissue that produces milk. And that's how most of the mammals feed their young. And this is the group that includes humans. Um, uh, so they have mammary glands uh, and they have hair and like I said three groups. The other one I don't have a picture of in this particular case is uh, the duck-billed uh, platypus um, that is an egg layer. Duck-billed platypus also found in Australia as are the kangaroos as well as the what's that one? Oh the the spiny echidna. Those are two of our egg-laying mammals, kind of a very unique group uh, found in Australia. You know, you want to see weird, unusual um, mammals, the best place to go is Australia for that. Okay, uh, and, and most of the stuff we have here uh, are in this group here, the Eutherian uh, mammals, we often call them, which includes us. Okay, so that ends today's uh, little intro on the different groups of living things.